Let us start for today. We have two topics today. First of all, we will complete the Fourier transform, which we started last week. And after that, in the second part of the lecture, we will start with the wavelets. But let's begin with the Fourier transform. So let's just recall the definition from last week. So what the definition says is we pick a function belonging to the function space L1 of R. And then we define the Fourier transform, which can be denoted in operator symbol as the capital F applied on F calculated in a point gamma. And we can also write it just as an F with a hat on the top evaluated at gamma, and we know this is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, f of x times e to the minus 2 pi i x gamma dx. And we saw some very important properties of the Fourier transform last time. So, first of all, we saw that the number if hat of gamma in absolute value, this measures the content of frequency gamma in our signal. And another important property we saw is that the operator F as I have written it here, it's a map that goes from L1 into the set of continuous functions on R. But we saw that this map can actually be extended to a unitary operator on L2 of R. And we, or I, decided not to put any tilde on the extension. So we just denote the extension by, L, by F again. So this is an extension to an operator from L2 of R into L2 of R. So we will see a very important property of the Fourier transform today. And it is not related to all of the space L2 of R. It is related to a subspace of L2 of R. So let's define that space first. And this is the so-called Paley-Wiener space. So the way this is defined is the symbol is P, W, and it is the set of functions in L2 of R that have the property that the Fourier transform is supported on the interval from minus a half to a half. So when we, like, when we look at the support of F hat, we get something that is contained in the interval minus a half to a half. So the interesting thing about this space is that we are looking at functions in L2, but the condition that we are writing down is not in terms of F, it is in terms of the Fourier transform of F. This is a F hat that we have here. So what it means is we are looking at some functions F, but I don't make a picture of F, I make a picture of F hat. So the F hat must be zero, and then it is doing something like this, and again, it has to go down and be zero. And this is taking place in the interval from minus a half to a half. So this is a picture of how the function f hat of gamma can look like. So the interpretation of this space what this condition says is that the Fourier transform is equal to zero outside the interval minus a half to a half. And because the Fourier transform evaluated in a point gamma, 
This measures the content of frequency gamma in the signal. Then this condition simply means that we are looking at signals that only contains frequencies up to the value a half. So PW contains signals with frequencies up to a half. And you might think that a half is not very interesting. This is a very low number. So if you think about what you can hear, you can hear frequencies up to 20,000. So why are we looking at frequencies just up to a half? This is something that you can, you can hardly hear it. The reason is that if you look at this normalization, we look at functions in this space, then we can write down a very nice theorem about, actually, we get an orthonormal base basis for this space, and we can just write down elements in this space in terms of the orthonormal basis. And then after doing so, we can just make a scaling on this interval, on the support, such that after formulating this theorem, we get another theorem which is much better, because this says now we can handle frequencies up to any alpha, where you just pick the alpha you want to look at. So this is just the starting point. We get the full theorem after that. So this is just a matter of convenience that we are looking at this funny number minus a half to a half at the beginning. Before I formulate that theorem, let me just define the key function. There's a function that we need to look at. And the key function for us is the sync function. So the sync function of x is actually something that we have looked at before. This is the function that is equal to sine pi of x divided by pi of x if x is non-zero. And then you can see exactly for x equal to zero. You cannot do this operation. But then you can look at the limit of this function as x tends to zero. And it turns out that this function tends to one when x goes to zero. So the natural value is to put it equal to one for x equal to zero. <coughs> this function actually appeared in mathematics two. And we also used it in this course. <coughs> Maybe you remember the time where we were uh, trying to check whether certain spaces were Banach spaces or not. And then we had to make a counterexample. We had to, to make some functions that could show that a certain space was not a Banach space. And then we used exactly this function for that purpose. I think we can make it a little more clear. No? OK. Now you recognize the function. You can see we are, we are looking at a slightly different scaling of the function because here I put in, maybe I should write it more carefully, this is the number pi times x and then divided by pi x. And you see the way we looked at it before was just sine x divided by x. So there's an additional pi here in the, in this inside the sine function and also here. But except for that, this is a function that we have seen before. And now you'll see how this function actually relates to the space PW. And this is a very famous statement that I'll put for you now. This is the so-called Shannon sampling theorem. So this is from around 1950. And this theorem actually connects almost everything that we have done in the course so far. So what it shows for us is that if we look at the function, the sync function, but not just the sync function by itself, but we look at all translates of this function, that means we put in the variable, which I just denote by some dot, and then we subtract k, and we let k run through all the integers. So what this means is we are looking at the, func the collection of functions where this is the, somehow the central function, and then we're just shifting it back and forth on the real axis. This is something we can write much more elegant, because we have the, the operator notation for the translation. So this is simply the same as the translation operator tk acting on the sync function. So the reason that I like this more is that you actually you avoid this notation with the dot, and you avoid the bracket. So somehow this is, this is a more easy notation. So the statement is that this collection of functions 
forms an orthonormal basis for exactly this space. And we can even say more than that. There are two more statements. So let me just write down the first one, and then later I will explain why we get this result. But what it says is that if you look at any function belonging to the paley wiener space, it can be written as the sum over k in the integers of some numbers, and these numbers turns out to be f of k times the sinc function. And let me again write it in the operator norm, in the operator sense, so tk acting on the sinc function. And this holds for all f belonging to p, w. And the way you should look at this identity is that this is, here we have an infinite series. This is an infinite series that takes place in the paley wiener space. And the paley wiener space is the subspace of L2, so the convergence of this series is in the space L2. But there's another statement also. So we could call this number one. Number two says that maybe you want to put in some x's also. You want to evaluate this function in a point x. And what the second part says, that if the function is continuous, then we are actually allowed to put in x's in this relationship. So then we have f of x equal to the sum, OK, in C of, and then exactly the same, f of k times tk sinc evaluated at x. And now we can write down exactly what this means. So this is the sum, OK, in C, the numbers f of k, and this translates in tk acting on sinc x. This is exactly the sinc function evaluated at x minus k. So this relationship holds point-wise whenever you put in an x. I want to stress the fact that this is, this is different, because here we are speaking about convergence in L2 of R. And this means that if you look at the difference between the function f and the partial sums of this, and we take the norm of this in L2, this will go to zero whenever we somehow let the index sets go to, to all the integers. So what this means, I can write down what this means exactly. This means that if you look at the norm of f minus the sum from k equal to minus n to n, f of k times tk sinc, then the norm of this in L2 goes to zero as n tends to infinity. And we know what this means. This means that if you look at the integral from minus infinity to infinity of, and then we take this to the power 2, f of x minus the sum This, what I have stated here, this is the norm to the power 2. But that the norm goes to 0, this is the same as to say that the norm to the power 2 goes to 0. So we can as well just say that this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So the first statement that we have here means exactly what I have stated here. And you can see this is different from what I have stated here, because here we are just speaking about convergence, like you know from mathematics 2. Whenever you put in an x, this is simply a number that comes out here, and this is an infinite sum consisting of numbers. So this is purely mathematics 2, and this is certainly convergence in the sense of a norm or in sense of mathematics 4. So this is the difference. How can we, how can we actually argue that we get something like this 
I mean, this is not something you would guess as you came in here today. So let's put some remarks to explain that. So first of all, if we know the first part, so if we are able to show that this sequence forms an orthonorm basis for the space, then we already know from our theory for orthonorm basis in Hilbert spaces that all elements in the space have a representation as an infinite linear combination of the basic elements. This is something we know. So if, if we know And I really mean this if because the proof is a little too long, so I'll not give the proof here. So if we have shown that T, K, sync, that this sequence forms an orthonormal basis. If we know this, then we know that all elements in the space have a representation in terms of exactly this sequence. This is exactly what our main theorem for orthonorm basis will tell us. So if you think about our very important statement here, theorem 472, then what it says is that if you have an orthonorm basis, then all elements in the space have a representation as a sum of the inner product between the element and the element in the orthonormal basis times the element in the orthonormal basis. So we can use this relationship. So what this tells us is that if you have an orthonormal basis, all f can be written as the inner product between the element, which is now an f, and then the element in the orthonormal basis, which is now t, k, sync. This is the coefficient, and this has to be multiplied with t, k, sync. And remember, the convergence we have here, this is convergence in terms of the norm on the Hilbert space. So this is exactly the type of convergence that we looked at here. But you see, what we have here is not exactly the same as what we have here, because here we would have to calculate these inner products, and what we claim here is that the, that the, the coefficients we can use are just, t of, uh, but are just given by functions values, f of k. So what we do is, first to show this, and then, in the proof, after using this, it has to be proved that the coefficients we have here, f, t, k, sync, they are exactly equal to the numbers that we have stated here, f of k. So this is the way the proof goes. First, we just show that it is an orthonormal basis. Then we relate to, to our theorem from orthonormal basis. And then we show that the coefficients are given by this expression. So I'll not go into any more details with the proof of the statement. But I want to, to discuss what the theorem actually tells us. So for the interpretation, it is actually easier to, to think about what is stated here. And I don't know how you look at it. Do you feel that this is just one among 100 other mathematical statements? Or do you see anything in this line that surprises you? Is there anything that somehow does not fit with the way you think about mathematics? Or you think this is a very natural statement? Let me make a picture of a natural signal. So it could be a sound signal, for example. So first, nothing happened, and then the music starts to play. And we know this looks somehow like this, and then it goes down, goes down, and it stops at this time. So this is a typical signal, f. And what it says is that this signal, f of x, will have a representation on, for example, we can look at, at this form. Yeah, it's surprising that we have a sum and not an integration because then it means that we only look at some of the I mean some of the functional values for, for f and that's you know then a lot of information. 
information won't be used at all, as it seems to the bus. Yes, this is a very exact description of what I wanted. You say this is very surprising because what we are saying here is we can recover all functions values f of x, but we don't use a lot of information. We only use the information, the f of k. If we just know the values f of k, we can just put into this formula, then we can reconstruct all values f of x. Because sinc x minus k, this is something we know, this is just the sinc function that I showed you. So there's nothing that changes here. All information about f is collected here. So in other words, let's make a, a rough picture. So let's say that, that this is, of course this is the zero, and let's say that this is one, and here we have two, three, four, and five. So what it says, what the theorem says is that all the function values can be found if you just know the value f of one, we know the value in this point, we know the value f of two, which is the value in this point, we know the value here, f of three, and so on. And of course, you also need to know f of the negative numbers. This is very surprising. So what it says is, if I make another picture and say, I know that for x equal to one, the function is here. For x equal to two, the function is here. For x equal to three, it is here. And so on in all the integers. Then I can tell you exactly which function we are speaking about. This is not the way you are thinking about functions in general, because if you just know that the function will pass these two points, you can make as many curves as you want that would go through these points. For example, you could just make a straight line going here and then down here and then connect the points like that. Or you can make a polynomial of second order that connects these points and then a new polynomial of second order that connects these points. So you can make infinitely many functions that will connect these points. How come that if you just know f1, f2, f3, and so on, then we can reconstruct all values f of x. This is because of the assumption. And the assumption says, I'm sorry, I should have written something else here. Didn't I tell you that I wanted an orthonorm basis for pw? So this is definitely pw we have here. I'm sorry. So we are speaking about the space pw. And for functions in this space, we know that we have an orthonorm basis. And then what the statement says, you see here I put it correctly, when we take functions in pw, then they have the representation like this, and if the function is continuous, we have this representation. So the reason that it is enough to know the values f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, and so on, this is that the assumption of a function sitting in pw is very strong. So because of this assumption, we can reconstruct all the function values. If we did not have the assumption that f is in pw, we would have no chance to do what we are doing here. Let's take an extra step. And this is actually a step that you will do in the problem session next week. So you can do a change of variable. So this is exercise 7, 1, 3, and this is something you'll do it as a homework next week. What it says is that if you have a function that is supported on an interval, um, I mean the, the Fourier transform is supported on an interval from alpha half, minus alpha half to alpha half, that means we pick some alpha that is positive, and then we look at functions with the same assumption as before, but now that the Fourier transform is supported on minus alpha half to alpha half. So you can more or less see what you have to do. You have to take exactly the assumption that we have here, but then you make some kind of scaling, so this interval from minus a half to a half get changed into minus alpha half to alpha half. So if you look at a function like this, then you can make a scaling in the theorem, and then what comes out is that f of x is equal to a sum or k in c, and then instead of just getting the function values as we had here, f of k, you will get f of k divided by alpha, and then again the sinc function, but not just evaluated in x, but in alpha x 
minus the k. So this result that we have here, let's just put a, a star so we can refer to it. This is actually the basic for all this business of analog to digital transversion. So if you think about, for example, a, a speech signal or a music signal, then this is something that is called an analog signal. But the way you will store it in a computer is as a sequence of numbers. And you see this is exactly what this theorem is doing, because here you have the analog signal. But what this representation tells you is that if you can just store these numbers, f of k divided by alpha, this is just a sequence of numbers. If you store them, then you have the full information about your analog signal. So this is exactly what we call analog digital conversion. And let, let me give you a, a very concrete example of that. So if you think about sound, then one of the problems for our ears is that we can only hear up to at most 20,000 hertz. Actually, I think for most of us, we cannot even hear up to 20,000. We can probably hear up to 10,000, 12,000. The older people get, the lower this number will be. So babies maybe can hear up to 20,000 hertz. But for us, it's, it's lower. So this means if you want to use this principle to store some information about a piece of music, there's no, no reason to store all frequencies. Actually, it is enough to store frequencies up to 20,000, because this is the limit for what we can hear. And this means that since we have this recipe for looking at, at functions with uh, Fourier transform supported up to minus alpha half to alpha half. We can just take an alpha that is equal to 40,000. So what this tells us is that any piece of speech or music can be represented as and then we just put in to, to the formula we have here, so we can represent any piece of music as f of x equal to the sum k of k in c, f of k divided by 40 thousand, and then times sinc x minus k. And what this means is we only have to store these numbers. Sorry? You have to multiply by 40, I have to multiply with 40,000 here as well. Thank you. What? Times four. Times four. <laughs> Thank you. So that means we only have to store the numbers. So we have to store the sequence of numbers that come here. So we have to store the numbers f of k divided by 40,000, where k runs through all the integers. Maybe you're getting a little bit surprised about this in the sense that when we speak about a piece of music, it starts here and it ends here. So somehow you might think that you only need to look at these samples inside this interval. But what you're doing is that you're actually changing your signal a little bit because you're cutting away all the frequencies about 40,000 hertz or 20,000 hertz. And this actually changes the signal such that the signal itself will no longer just be limited to, to the same interval as you had before, but the signal will actually change into a signal that is supported on the, real, on the entire real line. So that means you actually need to store all these numbers. It is an infinite sequence of numbers 
that you have to store in order to get the exact representation we have here. So the question is, how does it look like in practice? In practice, for example, if you want to use this procedure to store things on, on an MP3 player or things like that, you cannot use an infinite sequence of numbers. You have to cut it off somewhere. So that means, in practice, we are storing some numbers of the form f of k divided by 40,000, where k goes from minus n up to n for some n. So in principle, this describes exactly what is going on in your MP3 player. The question is, are MP3 players using exactly this or just using something that is related to this? And the truth is, they are not using exactly the Shannon sampling theorem. They're using some mon more modern versions of the Shannon sampling theorem. And the reason is that now we know that it is possible to do it this way. We know that we have this representation, but there's a slight problem with the sync function. And the problem is that it actually continues to oscillate for a long time. So if you look at this function, maybe you don't consider it as slow decay, but it actually has quite slow decay in the sense that it is going to zero, but it takes quite a long time before it goes to zero because these bubbles continue for a long time. So that means this function has a very slow decay, and this means that if you want to get a good approximation of this infinite series, then due to the slow decay of the term that is here, then you have to include a lot of numbers, f of k. So that means if you want to do the MP3 player with this theorem, actually you will have to use a sequence of numbers of this type, but you have to use a very large number for the n. That means your MP3 player will not be a small device like this, it will be a big device like this. So therefore, we do not make MP3 players exactly using this th theorem. But what people are doing is they look at other ways of getting expansions of this type with functions in place of the sync function that have much faster decay. So they simply go very fast to zero. And this means in order to get a good convergence here, we only have to include a, a small number of coefficients. And this means that you can take this piece of music and you can compress it to a very small data set. And then you can make the MP3 player like you know it. So theoretically, everything works here, but it just requires us to use too much data in practice. We will do a little bit more in the second part of the lecture, not really related to the Fourier transform, but related to, to wavelets. We will come back to, to issues that are very similar to what I have discussed here. But before we do that, I want to say just a few words more about the Fourier transform. And this is mainly for the sake of the problem session today, because you will also work with the so-called convolution today. So I want to define the convolution for you, and I just want to get you started on the exercise you'll do today on the convolution. But the line we have discussed here will be continued in the next part of the lecture. So actually, convolution is a very important tool in the context of the Fourier transform, but I have to say we will not use it very much in this course. So what I'll say will more or less be on, on just two blackboards, and then I'll show you the example. So the definition says that we have to pick two functions, f and g, and they have to to belong to the space L1 of R. And then associated to these two functions, we, we define the convolution. And the convolution will be denoted with F and then some star and G. So the convolution should be a new function
So we write f star g, and then we have to tell what function we are dealing with. So we have to tell what is the value in a point y. And the way this is defined is again as an integral. So this is an integral from minus infinity to infinity. We have to take the first function and calculate it in the point y minus x and multiply with the second function evaluated at x dx. So you will see very soon why we define the, the convolution this way. So first, you know, when we write down things like this, we have to argue that this is actually well defined and this is shown in a lemma just after the definition. So the lemma says that the convolution f convolved with g evaluated at y, this is actually well defined. So you know now what you would have to check. You simply look at the expression we have here and then you look at an absolute value and you have to do some estimates and show that what comes out is finite. So we know how to do that. So this is well defined. And moreover, what comes out here, the function f convolved with g turns out to belong to L1. Whenever you have a function in L1, you know that you're allowed to make a Fourier transform. So due to, to the statement here, you can look at the Fourier transform of f convolved with g. And now you see the reason why we have defined the, the convolution as we have. There's a theorem that says, if you look at the convolution f convolved with g, and you take the Fourier transform of this, then you simply get the product of the Fourier transform of the two functions. So this is the same as the Fourier transform of f times the Fourier transform of g. So actually, the way people usually apply this relationship is that they want to calculate this convolution, but they cannot do it directly. So instead of, of calculating the convolution here, what they do is they say at least the Fourier transform of the convolution is given by this expression. So usually people will just calculate what, whatever we have here, and then to get rid of the Fourier transform, they will apply the so-called inverse Fourier transform to what we have on this side, and then they get the function f convolved with g back that way. So the statement we have here is, is thought of as a tool to calculate the convolution f convolved with g. So what you'll do today at the problem session You will look at an exercise, and the first part of that exercise is to calculate the convolution of the characteristic function on the interval 0, 1 with the characteristic function on the interval 0, 2. So let's see what happens when we do that. You see, up here, most of the time I was careful and I put this bracket around the function. You can see already here, I didn't put it anymore. So it's actually up to you if you want to put a bracket around the, the convolution or not. So let's just write it like this. One function convolved with another one, evaluated at the point gamma without putting this bracket around it. I think we understand what we mean. So according to the definition, so now we just put in to, to the definition here, this is the integral from minus infinity to infinity. And then we take the first function, the characteristic function for the interval 0, 1, and we calculate in y minus x, and then we multiply with the second function calculated at x. So in principle, you can see we are supposed to integrate from minus infinity to infinity. But here, this is a function of x, and this is only taking non-zero values on the interval 0, 2. So here we have a function that is equal to 1 on the interval 0, 2, and otherwise it's equal to 0. So this means that it's actually enough just to look at the integral from 0 up to 2, and then the characteristic function 0, 1 of y minus x dx. And this is the point where the problem appears, because how
how can we continue from here? How can we estimate the integral that comes out here? So what I suggest that you do is you find out which values of x will contribute to this characteristic function. So you know the characteristic function is either 1 or it is 0. But whether it's 1 or 0 depends on which y we are looking at, and it depends on the x as well. So how can we make this interplay of x and y to work? So I think let's find out when the function is equal to 1. So the function is the characteristic function for the interval 0, 1 calculated in y minus x. So at some point we have to fix our y because we want to calculate this function in the point y. So at some point we have to say now we are looking at a specific y. So somehow we have to find out for which value of y will this give 1 and for which values it will give 0. So what we have here is equal to 1 if whatever we put in, y minus x, if this belongs to the interval 0, 1, and it is equal to 0 if y minus x does not belong to 0, 1. But we can formulate this in a different way. So now we think about y as something that is fixed. Then we want to find out which values of x will actually contribute here. So we can do that by isolating the x. So we can say the function will take the value 1 if, and then what we can do first is to switch the order and say y minus x should belong to 0, 1. This means that x minus y should belong to the interval minus 1 to 0. And here we can say it is 0 if, and in the same way, if x minus y does not belong to minus 1, 0. So what this means is that we get the value 1 if, and here you say x minus y belongs to minus 1 to 0. This is the same as to say that x belongs to, and then you take the y and put in here, so we get y minus 1 up to y, and it is 0 if x does not belong to the interval y minus 1 up to y. So what this tells us is that whenever we are fixing our y, we get contributions for the x that are sitting in this interval. But they have to sit in another interval as well, because we are just looking at x in the interval 0, 2. So here we get contributions for x sitting in the interval from 0 to 2 that at the same time are sitting in the interval y minus 1 to y. So what we have to look at is exactly the set of x that belongs to the interval 0, 2, because this is the integration interval. And we also have to get a contribution for the function we are looking at and this is what we get for exactly this interval. So here, we actually have to split into different intervals for the y. And I'll just do, do the first of one, or maybe the first two of them, and then you do the rest. So we will split into the cases where y is smaller than 0, and we will split into the case where y is bigger than or equal to 0, and smaller than 1, y bigger than, two, than uh, 1, smaller than or equal to 2. and so on, like this. So what happens if y is smaller than 0? Then we get contributions for the x in this interval. So the interval from 0 to 2 intersected with the interval from y minus 1 up to y. 
This is actually the empty set because if y is negative, then this interval is on the negative half plane. That means it has no intersection with the interval from 0 to 2. So what this means is that when we look at the convolution that is given by this formula, then there are no x values that will contribute because there are no x values that belong to the interval and also make this function being equal to 1. So there's no contribution for this at all. So that means the convolution is equal to 0. What happens if you look at y between 0 and 1? Then we can see there's an upper bound here. This is positive. This one is negative because y is smaller than 1, so y minus 1 is negative. That means when we intersect with the interval 0, 2, what comes out is exactly the interval from 0 up to y. So this means that the convolution we are looking at This is exactly an integral from 0 up to y. This is the interval where we get contributions. And on this interval, the function is 1 because as soon as this function is not 0, we know it is equal to 1. So this is simply an integral from 0 up to y dy, which is equal to y. And then you simply you do the same for the rest of the cases. And then what comes out is a function that goes like this. It is 0 on the first part of the interval and then it goes like y, like we have seen here, and then it is constant on an interval, and then it goes down to zero again and continues to be zero. So this is what you will have to do today. And as I say, the convolution is not something we will use heavily in this course, but at least you have to see that it exists and you have to do this exercise. Okay, let's take our break and meet again at 2 o'clock.